Concord, our home country, Concord, North Carolina, and then we're going to be in Virginia Beach, and then uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania, and then up to Battle Creek, Michigan, and then right after that, we're going to be in uh, 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 Phoenix, Arizona for a one-nighter, then Maui, then Honolulu, and um, uh, then we're going to be in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We'd love to see you there. It's not too far from here, and um, wonderful conferences coming up in Pennsylvania and Missouri, and uh, Dallas Fort Worth, speaking of Texas. Uh, and uh, so a lot, a lot of great places. And then October is a big one for us because we're going to be among all, all the other ones that are throughout the summer. We're also going to be a uh, big one in Nashville, Tennessee, of course, uh, this summer too. Uh, there's going to be a powerful Europe trip uh, where Kevin and Kathy and the team were going to be uh, flying to Switzerland uh, with our friends there and then down to Cape Town, South Africa and then up to Germany uh, to uh, finish it out. So we're real excited, so many wonderful places, so many wonderful things, and real quick, if you're looking for a fellowship, uh, raise your hand again if you're a fellowship host. Raise your hand if you host, look at all these hosts of fellowships. And so I've been talking to them, they, I don't recognize all the cities, unfortunately, but you know, they're, they're all over, they're spread out. This young man right here has one in Austin. This year. Well, yeah. Georgetown, Georgetown, thing, I think of D.C., so wherever Georgetown, uh, Texas is, uh, that's where he's at, so that's another one. So, but my point is, if you go online, uh, there's, there's a, it, it, you here as well, if you can't connect with somebody, if you go online, there's a button on Ke uh, Kevin's website, uh, top right-hand corner that says, find a fellowship, and then plug in your address, and then one will pop up, we'll, they'll be, these guys here will be sent an email, and so you can connect with them. So uh, we appreciate if you did that. 
Then finally, uh, we do need help at the end. Somebody needs to fly Kevin's plane back home if anybody's available. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, we do need help with all the uh, materials and loading warrior truck and all that good stuff. If you could stick around for a few minutes and just help us with some of the material and, and some of the sound stuff, uh, we certainly appreciate that. It doesn't take long if we all do it together. Uh, we just got to get it up on the truck and uh, get the warrior truck on the road. Amen. So um, off to its next destination. So if you could help at the end, just see Chris back there uh, in that corner and uh, he can help you out with that. Uh, so we certainly appreciate that. So ready to receive an offering? Yeah. All right. Well, well, I'm excited because I, I'm behind the scenes and I know all, all I see where, what God is doing with the finances of this ministry. You know, all these instruments last night. I mean, look at these little lives were changed. I was talking to our friends here uh, that they, they, they were playing their instruments uh, late at night. Uh, and uh, right, Lance, uh, just uh, I'm sure the neighbors were really appreciated that. But uh, we, uh, but that's why they're there. That, you know, get your kids playing instruments, and uh, that's why Kevin does it because he wished that he had that kind of help when he was young. So we're Kevin and the team were sewing into your children so they could play. Uh, by the way, that um, bluish uh, uh, teal uh, saxophone, soprano saxophone. You know, he took that out of the box right before we got right as we got here. You know, so that's. That's what you can do in the glory, amen? Just take it out of the box and play it. So we're playing that anointing and impartation on you all. So anyway, thank you for being a part and thank you for giving into the offering and just thank you for partnering with us and just being a part of this ministry. So Father, we thank you for the opportunity to sow. We thank you for Warrior Notes, Kevin and Kathy in this ministry, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that nations are being touched, lives, single moms, uh, Lord, so many people are being touched around the world through this wonderful ministry, Lord. And we thank you for the opportunity to give into what you're doing, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, if you uh, take the offering. And then if you want to give online, you can do text to give. The number should be up on the screen. Pastor Mike. Well, good morning, church. So as a pastor, I want to encourage you with this because when you have received such an impartation... That impartation that should turn into transformation and that should turn into fruit in your life. So you need to take everything that God's been saying and doing and take this next week and really begin to unpack it. Like all you students, take this study guide that we're here, take your warrior justice. If you're not a student, you are now. Congratulations. Because yeah. <laughs> we're all students, right? And you want to unpack what God has been saying and doing inside of you. Because you're going to find in that, that that is where you're sowing into your harvest. Because so many of you have such gifts and talents that this whole weekend is to activate you, right? It's to get the fire inside of you. So really begin to pray and consider what is God saying to you? Because we need to start more fellowships. We need to reach more people. For all of you uh, students and, and the partners, everyone that came and helped pack food, you know, you can start this at your home. If you have kids, parents, you know, go to the grocery store with your kids. You know, my, one of my youngest ones, she actually earned a little bit of money. And the first thing she said she wanted to do with that money was she went to the grocery store and she got some groceries with her own money and put it in our food pantry at the church. But here's the thing. If we can do this now with our kids, can you imagine the what we could do in this generation with all of us teaching and investing in our children and ourselves. So I want you guys to stay connected with us, whether it's on social media, where you chat, partnerships, student fellowships, because this year Kevin has been filming. Listen, there's so much stuff that's coming. Uh, yesterday, he talked a little bit about the Captain Kevin shows. We've got music school. We've got, we've got master degrees courses that are being filmed that will literally make your brain melt, okay? It'll melt. We'll put it in the forge. It'll come out, and it'll be perfect, okay? Listen, everything in this world wants to melt your brain. You might as well let God do it so you come out right, <laughs> right? Amen. So we want you guys to be connected with us. If you have teenagers, we want them invested in getting part of the school. Listen, we all know if any of you, how many of you have paid for college, whether it's you or your kids, you know how much a credit hour is, okay? 
We're in old school ministry right now, full price, everybody say full price, is $75 a credit hour, which is ridiculous, okay? But honestly, nobody pays full price when it's Warrior Notes, because <laughs> it's Kevin and Kathy. So I want to encourage you, if you're new to the school this weekend, Kevin did exceptional courses on Warrior Justice. And let me tell you, if you have a devil problem, if you have a people problem, if you have a self problem, if you have a problem, <laughs> this course will give you the keys and the equipment to walk it out. Because what we're finding all over the world is, is that we've been waiting on somebody to fix it when God's given us the tools for us to resolve it ourselves. So we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait anymore. You can begin the work that God wants to do in you right now. So we want you to get plugged in, okay? Because we know that what God is doing in this generation, everything that Kevin was talking about, fire in the heavens, that is for his bride. And that's us. So we don't want to miss a moment. We want to embrace it. We want to grab it. And we want to run with it with all our hearts. Amen? Amen. All right. Dr. Kevin Zadai, maybe? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Just so you know, Jesus gets jealous when you bring attention to me. So you don't want to, do, you know, in other words, I want you to, I'm just telling you this because I, I, I appreciate your, your appreciation for me and everything. But um, I know how ministers have gotten into the situations they have and it's because they got too much attention. And, and, um, you know, I'm not going to have that problem because God <laughs> made sure that he humbled me to the place where I'm not going back. But I just want, I want to tell you that um, I would want you to, to stand up and worship Jesus and thank God for me. And I know that's what you're doing. But I just wanted to be clear to the people online that, and, and people that watch us that you're not, you're not, um, you're not giving me undue uh, you're just saying, a, you're saying your appreciation. So anyway, I just want, I just want you to know that I am not going to touch the glory that belongs to Jesus. And I mean, there's no way he's going to share that, that attention with me. Now he gives us his glory. He shares that glory with us. But anyway, I just have to say, cause then I'll feel better. Cause you all aren't doing anything wrong. It's just that I want you to make sure that you understand that if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't even be here. So, and you know all that. It's just, I feel like ministers, um, they like the attention. <laughs> you know, I think we all want attention, you know, and I don't want that to ever. Um, okay, yeah, you found it. Is this the one? Okay, I, um, I didn't get a chance to play this one yet. Scott, come up here. I didn't get to, 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 to get this one out of the box and play it. So I, am, I apologize. I can work with you and get it all tuned up and played. But um, the Lord spoke to me when you were on the airplane with me, and um, he told me that you're supposed to play this. So anyway, um, so there you go. And then I, I, will, um, I will work with you, and it, we'll get it. But isn't that beautiful? So I was supposed to uh, get this all, you know, because I play all of them for, for a couple services before that I hand them out to people. But I got worn out because I think it was in Orlando. I, I had to break in like four of them. I gave away four of them. And this is supposed to take a year to, for them to sound the way they do. It takes about a year of playing. And they were, the anointing was getting them tuned in like 10 minutes. So anyway, I will, this is, you're supposed to play this. You, you don't have to play it tomorrow, but the Lord just told me to give this to you, okay? All right. And we'll work with you to get it. So this is an alto. This is this is uh, going to be in the key of E flat. So you'll you can look up your um, YouTube videos and, and I'll help you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. All right. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I just didn't. I I just I'm getting worn out of you know these instruments. You know, I literally go into a, a, a dark room. That's how I learn to play them. And so all the 14 instruments I play, you know, you haven't seen a lot of them because I, I go for like a year or two with each instrument. So you miss the cello and the, uh, the electric guitar, but um, Jason plays the electric guitar uh, really well and I, he doesn't need my help. So 
Um, in the cello, it's really, it's really a finicky instrument, so you put it on the truck. I mean, the, the truck does something to it, you know, <laughs> that you have to, like, tune it. So um, it, I've gotten away from the cello, but I want to get back into it again. But it's, and the same with the violin and all, all the other instruments. I play the trumpet. Um, it, it's just a lot of work to get those things, um, you know, right. So uh, anyway, I felt like uh, the Lord was wanting me to minister to your children and uh, give them give them the chance that I didn't have. My dad, they couldn't even afford a little drum pad. I want to get a drum pad. It was 10, I remember it was 10 bucks at the music store with the sticks and they couldn't afford it. My dad was a professional saxophone player for 65 years. And he never once gave me a lesson, never even off, I've never touched his saxophone. Never once. Yeah, but now, you know, at the end of his life, right before he passed, um, I came out with an album where I, I did the whole album myself. It, it w went to number seven on Billboard charts, and I did the whole album myself in my office. And I played the saxophone for an hour, and my dad wept. He goes, there is no way. There is no way you can do that. And my, my mom said for, for the days before he passed, he would sit there and cry all day listening to that album. <laughs> So, but, but um, anyway, I, I want to do what, I want to do what um, others should have done. And that's what you're seeing here. So thank you for all your donations and everything that you do, because, you know, if you, if you just continue to come alongside us, we're just going to make this, um, you know, possible for people. Uh, all, the, all the education that we do. I feel like I'm just rambling, but I just love you all. I just want to talk. I just want to sit and have coffee with you all. I don't even want to do this. It feels so weird to get up here and do all this. I, I'd rather just sit with you all by the fireplace and, and, and talk, you know. That's just me. I mean, me and Kathy, that's what we do. We just kind of hang out together all, all day and pray and throw rocks at the alligators in our yard. And, you know. They actually went away. The alligators went away. They might have gotten a shot, I don't know. I can't remember, I can't remember, it's a blur. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you heard, you heard about the squirrel problem. It cost me about $12,000. They, they got into my house uh, several times and um, they'd sit there and mock me as I'm reading my Bible. You know, like they're, they're doing their planning. They got their hard hats on and... Oh, you wouldn't believe it. These things are not, th these things are not from God. <laughs> so they're sitting there, and they're, I know what they're doing. They're planning their next scheme, you know, so. I spent four grand um, to repair my house and try to fortify it, and that didn't work. So I spent another four grand with someone else, and that didn't work. And then we got Bobby, who pretty much is a full-time repairman now for us, and he fixed it. He goes, um, Every time we have a rodent problem, he goes, somebody's leaving and it's not going to be me. And he, te he, tells, he tells the rodents that, you know, <laughs> your days are numbered. <laughs> so he fixed the house and uh, you're not going to believe this. They, they, went, they went and made their home in my Pathfinder. <laughs> they went up into the distributor cap and they had all the nuts and, and palm nuts and acorns, and, or not acorns, but... Because my, my car was, it started not wanting to, to run right. So they opened the distributor cap and there was like palm nuts and all kinds of stuff in there. And they went, they went and just took up residence in my car. So um, we got that repaired. So it was about 12 grand. And so they're all just sitting out there in the yard. They can't get into the house or the car anymore. And so one day I just got on Amazon and I ordered a, a BB gun <laughs> with a sight, with a really nice sight. And then like one of those things where you set it, you know, for a sniper, the little stand thing. And I, all I did was I took it out of the box and I just set it on the front porch so you could see it, you know. And they all left. Not, not one shot was fired.
Those squirrels were injured in this commercial. <laughs> so the, the, bottom, the bottom line for us here, all of us, is that sometimes you just have to display your authority. You know, just a, a, a foot stomp sometimes. I mean, I've ministered to people where literally demons have left. All I did was walk up to them and stomp my foot. <laughs> There's times where demons have left where I just, I just touched them like this as I'm walking. Um, there's, there's all kinds of ways to establish authority, but I feel like at times that, that we get real starchy about our relationships and about the way that we do things, you know, in a, you know we, we call it a service or something like that. But, you know, I picture the, the New Testament church, they were in houses, and every now and then they were checking to see if the Roman soldiers were down there on the street. You know, that's, that's kind of like, that, that's how the church started. And um, they were always concerned. You know, you don't think about these things, but they were always concerned because the Lord told me. They were always, the believers were always concerned that someone would actually betray them among the, the group. And there was all this betrayal that was going on, like Judas, what Judas did. So... Um, what I want to, I feel the Spirit's wanting me to, to talk to you about this morning is the fact that um, nobody's really immune to betrayal. And you got to remember that, that um, it's, it's the message that I, I'm not even allowed to talk about on, on some networks, um, some people, some ministries. Um, for, they ask me not to talk about certain things. And that's why we're doing this. And then, uh, you know, and I had to find a publisher that would actually publish uh, my books without editing stuff out. And um, eventually I just felt like I was supposed to go on my own. The Lord told me to own everything. So we just buy, we buy with cash everything. So we own our own publishing company. We own um, everything, you know, and, and I feel like that's better to keep it pure but uh, what he told me was, the, now listen to me, he, you know, the Lord told me, he said, everybody has their sellout point. And he said um, that when push comes to shove or what, however you want to say it, everyone will have that breaking point where they can't go on with you anymore. Everyone will. Be, why? He said, because of self-preservation, he said. So there's a certain point where you got to, people count the costs and they think, well, you know, Jesus obviously is not going to set him up as king, himself as king. So obviously it's another failed coup, which was happening all the time in Jerusalem. And, and actually in history, even during the time that Jesus was there, there were people being crucified on the streets for insurrection. And that's what, that's what happened in our country is they're just crucifying these people in front of everybody to bring fear about ever thinking about taking your government back. That's all it is. But they did this in Jesus' day. So this happened while Jesus was there. So um, the, the whole thing about the mentality of the, the Messianic, uh, the whole thing about Messianic it was is that the, they misinterpreted that Jesus would come and set himself up as king, that that Messiah was going to take back the occupation um, that, of, of Rome. So they, they had gotten into this mentality that the Messiah was a physical king that would take over and rule and reign there in Jerusalem. So you understand that? That was the mentality. So you've heard the word zealot, right? And um, there was actually, uh, it, 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 it talks about uh, there, there was a, a zealot on, the, on the Jesus' staff, but there was actually two, Judas was one too. And the zealots would actually assassinate a Roman soldiers. He would, they would isolate them and they were just assassins. So they were like snipers, but they used a dagger. And that was part of the movement was to try to eliminate one by one the Roman soldiers in Rome. But, you know, they just kept sending soldiers, you know. They sent two or three for every one they lost. So, 
their idea was, was political. So all the Jews, all, even the, you can see, you know, you just think about this. You could see that the disciples were thinking this. So they were involved in the politics of what was going on. Jesus never addressed the politics at all. He never even mentioned, he never m mentioned like, you, you know, Caesar. He never mentioned Caesar. He, he, told, he mentioned Herod, so you go tell that fox. You know, he, but he didn't speak against the, pre, the, the occupation that was there. If you read the Gospels, it's just not there. He, he was focused on what he was called to do, which was preach the good news, and then he allowed himself to be turned over. So it was a trap. Because the powers, if they would have known, they would not have crucified the Lord. They, they would have not, they fell into the trap. Do you get it? Okay, I say all this because the Spirit of the Lord is really strong to, to, to know that God knows where your breaking point is, how far you can go with something. But warrior notes, what I'm doing here is to increase your confidence in what you do know and what you do believe to the point where you can actually go further than you would normally go. Your breaking point, the, the zone increases to where you can stay in there a lot longer. So there is a lot, just so you know, there's a lot of generals that have gone on to be with the Lord. And I know personally that they went to be with the Lord because the Lord did not want them at the end of their life to go through what we're going through. Now, he told me that. A lot of generals have left. But the confidence in the Spirit is, is that all of us can not only do what they did, but supersede them. I mean, that's the handoff. The handoff is always going to be better. Like when we did relay races in state championships, we, we put the worst person number two. And the next to the worst person was number three. The best person was number four. The second best person was number one. The whole idea was, is not to put your best first, but put one that will shock the other racers with that first leg, to, to, to let them do a leg that was a, a record-breaking um, leg. If they were running a single race, like a single race, whatever those laps were, we would run our leg and beat the school record for the single race. But we got four people running that. We would all run the record for the single race of that. So if it was a two mile race and we were all running a, qu a quarter of that, our, qu our leg would be the record if that was just the race right there, our leg. We would break the record in states. But what you would do is to trick, you would, we would put somebody very fast at the beginning so that it does, it disheartens. But see, at the end of the race, the surprise is, is that you always, you always save your best for last. But the, the management of all that in, the, in our minds was, is if something went wrong and someone was not able to do their leg, at least at the record, because we're calculating hundreds of seconds here ahead of time, is that the last person, the responsibility of the last person was to make up for all of the lag or the mistakes that were made for each person. Do you get it? So that's where we are. God trusts us at the very end with the very, he's, he sees us as the very best. But nobody's preaching that because it's, it's I don't hear a lot of good news being preached. But the good news is, is that God trusts us. Right? Okay. So what happened was, in states, I was not even scheduled to do this race because you're only allowed to participate in four events at that level. Well, I'd already, I'd already was in four different, in the states, I was already in four different things. And some of them was like pole vaulting. 
and I think the javelin was the other one. So I, I nixed the javelin because there's no way I could win. And I, I took this race, but it was because somebody was sick and they just needed me to do it. Well, they put, put me last because that was what that guy was registered as is the final leg. But this is not my race. You know, this is not something I trained for. And I told the coach, I said, listen, man, you should put me like second or third. And he said, well, they're already registered this way and you can do this. Just, just, just while you're running, pretend like somebody's chasing you with a knife. That's what he, that's what he said. That's what he said. So um, anyway, Anyway, um, we won. We we won the we won the state champion, and we also broke broke a record. But the bottom line was is that the whole idea for me was I thought I better not have anything left in me when I fall to the ground after I cross the finish line, because um, you know there's there was so much at stake. Well, this is what happened. Those, all those guys were way behind. Every single leg was behind. So, you know, it's just two seconds or so, but it ends up being six or eight seconds, you know, <laughs> when you add them all up, you know. And I'm like, I told the coach, and he's like, I'm out there, and you know, I'm getting ready, you know, and I have to stay off the track until they come by the last time, and then I gotta go out there and be ready to, to get the baton, and then you have to start running, and you only have a certain amount of time where you have to have the handoff or you're disqualified. So you have to start running and gauge so you don't get disqualified. You gotta stay in that lane. You can't go into someone else's lane or the coach, the, the reference right there to disqualify you. And I'm talking to him and I'm saying, there's, you know, I'm not a magician. There is no way <laughs> these guys are like messing up. But it's like, and the pressure was on. But see, the thing of what it was is about what I feel about us here and, and why we're here on the earth is that God knows that we can do this. But, but how, how, you, how you have to do this is you have to realize that you have a point where you break and you can't go on. But don't be like Judas where he, what he did was he, he was calculating and he saw that, you know, when they had the, the day, um, uh, when they sang Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and they put palm branches down. Well, that was to fulfill prophecy that they knew was there. But see, they were like ushering him in so that he would go right up into the center there and announce that he's king. That's literally what they expected. So if you noticed, did you ever wonder why um, they honored him and, and yelled all that? And then the next day, did you, did you notice the next day they went to throw him over the brow of the hill? Did you ever wonder why? Well, I do too, so I asked Jesus. And he said, it's because I didn't meet their expectations. I didn't set myself up as king physically there, so they thought it was another failed attempt, which had always happened. You're not gonna believe which, which the previous one was, Barabbas. So when, that, when Pilate asked, which one do you want? They chose Barabbas because they thought, well, at least this guy tried and failed, that he got arrested. Do you follow me? Yeah. Okay, so your sellout point is based really honestly, but nobody wants to understand themselves. But I'm gonna help you understand yourself. The bottom line is you have unrealistic expectations but you don't know it. So you're putting pressure on everything around you to come up to your standard, but it may never, because you can't make people do anything. Just try to be a pastor. I mean, it's exactly like a marriage. The same things, that the top four things they say are putting pressure on a marriage are the same four things 
that I encountered as a pastor. The temperature, the music, and the money, and who's in charge. It's the same, pro it's the same four problems. You could set it at 72, and you think, man, that is like spot on. No, it's not spot on. You got, I mean, you got, you got a fight going on over 72. And then if you don't do a hymn in the music, if you just do that Bethel stuff, how about, how about, how about the sound guy yelling four songs and no more? When you go to the fifth song, he yells out four songs and no more. How about, how about this? At 12 o'clock, people start jingling their keys. And people want to have a chicken dinner on Friday night. I just like, okay, yeah, we'll cook the chicken and we'll hand it out to the, to the homeless. Well, no, no, that, that's for us. We, we give in the offering, you know. See, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, the bottom line is, is that the Lord in this place at this time counts on us to do it right, but unrealistic expectations will, will cause you to be disappointed. You can't expect people to just do the right things because you ask them to. And then if you make rules, then, then you're a dictator, or you're religious, you know. And me and, me and Sven, we actually, we actually wear two watches. I don't have mine on yet. I'll put it on before I fly with them. But we actually wear two watches. And all the, all the ground people, the, air pe the airport people, they're like, why are you wearing two watches? And he, what he says is, well, why are you wearing two shoes? <laughs> and it's just to, to get, because people get too serious, so we're just like, so I bought him a sundial watch. It's a sundial. You just flip it up. Because you can mess with people. It's just so easy to mess with people. It's like, so people say, why do you wear a tie? I mean, and you're like, you don't wear a tie to church? <laughs> See, you just flip it on everybody. The, the bottom line is this. Every culture is different. And I don't believe, I don't believe that any culture is correct. Yeah, that's right. I believe that people make their culture a certain way. I, I, why is it, I mean, I know, I know, I know ministers right now, they go, they been in places where they don't wear clothes or they don't wear hardly any clothes, at least not in the right places they should be wearing certain clothes, and, and they get saved. And they told me, they said the next day after getting saved, they came with covered, but nobody told them to. When the demons left, the demons would leave people, they would come clothed the next day. What told them to do that? Well, it was because whatever was there is not there anymore. And so the influence on a culture could be the demonic activity that they were involved with, is what I'm trying to say. So with you, there's certain things that if, the, if there was any kind of demonic influence that once it was gone, you might change your mind about some things. Because the influence of that is gone. So I know that you're all frustrated and, and you have a righteous indignation in you, which means that you can sense the injustice and everything that's going on. But the Lord is telling you right now that you got to release that to him because he has the power to do something about it. But he may have to insert himself into your thinking to tell you what the way out is. It may not be what you think. Now, I can tell you 
when the problem occurred that you should have known, because when, when I was alerted of this, it was the governor of Arkansas that became the head honcho. I have to do this for algorithms part. But when he got in, if you look at how many people actually voted, he won by 39%. Check it out. Okay, he got reelected by less than that. Okay, so that means that there was less than 50% that showed up. Do you, are you following me? Okay, if you wanna play with the system, there are other ways that God can play with that system to undermine what's really going on. Because Texas doesn't put up with those things that tabulate. What I'm trying to tell you is open your mind and let God tell you how to go from here. Because it's a chess game. So your unrealistic expectations of well, how it should work, how people should be, are causing you to be frustrated and it's causing you to even have, uh, it hurts your health, it hurts everything. You can't make people do the right thing you, you can't even make people see the, your way. The only way to do this is to be established in the Spirit and let the Spirit of God dictate what you believe and have confidence in it, and then just live your life out as though you're working for the Lord, that He's your employer, that He's your, your father, that He's your family and you just be dedicated to him and then find people that you can agree with, which is what we're doing here. And release what you think should happen, release it. So they took Barabbas, well what happened with that? Nothing. And the, and the demonic spirits fell right into the trap and crucified Jesus, which was part of the plan. And that's exactly how it is with us. The things you don't know is the things that God is doing for you without your knowledge. There is a whole thing going on with this country that I have never announced to you that I know what has happened. We were supposed to go in a promised land in about 14 days, but it's, 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 we are in the desert and for 40 years, it won't be that long, but you, you get the principle, is essentially God put this country into the desert. And it's the wilderness of sin. If you look in the back of your Bible, the, the Bible chart says wilderness of sin. It's actually called that on the map. <laughs> and what happens is, is God says, I'm going to see what's in you, is what the Bible says. I, it was to test you to see what was in you. What I'm telling you is, is you're released from the process because you passed. Amen. You're the two. You're the two that had the good report. But Joshua and Caleb suffered for 40 years with those numbskulls. Is everybody following me? This is the word of the Lord for this morning. Okay, so you're not being disciplined. You can't understand, like it's a good land. There's plenty, we're well able to take these giants out, right? So the frustration you can't, you got to route your energy toward your walk with God and your anointing and not fighting people or that feeling that I feel where I can't breathe. I'm so, I'm so frustrated all the time because I know exactly what was supposed to happen. But I'm just one person. But the Lord said, you want to know the most effective thing you can do is love people because you'll be a hero right now if you are a minister and you are giving instead of taking and you're loving people and you genuinely care 
and you tell people, you know, the reason we have 33,000 students is because there is nobody that disqualifies himself from taking a course because of financial problems. There, no, there is nobody that has any reason to not take a course. There is no reason for, nobody, for anybody to not come to a conference because it's free and you get about $50 worth of stuff for free that you would have to pay if you went to the book table. And not only that, your kids get to actually have fun with other kids that is in an environment where, you know, I'm not dressed up like a drag queen, like at school, you. I mean, at least when you, you send them here, you know, you know, I identify as a male. And I know that there's cities that were destroyed over that kind of sin. There's no smell of sulfur here. There's no pillar of salt in here. There's nothing going on in here with that kind of judgment. You got to remember that there were cities that were destroyed. People were destroyed for the kind of things that we tolerate today. Right? Okay. So Joshua and Caleb had to ride it out. So they just took Warrior Notes courses, you know, for 40 years <laughs> and prayed in tongues. No, you know what I mean? They had, to, they had to ride it out until the governors of states got it right, until the local governments got it right, till we, we got back and we started honoring authority again. You, you, know, you know that the drug problem could be stopped in 24 hours. I mean, I would stop it in 24 hours. But see, it's not being stopped because the supply is not being stopped. And there's a reason why that is, because of this. It's the same with alcohol and everything else. So you'll, you'll identify with this. You, you, you know the people who are fighting, fighting for marijuana and all that stuff. So how would you feel if you showed up to my airplane and I'm going to take you to Colorado Springs and I'm, I'm smoking a joint? as your boys, you see what I'm saying? Okay, so all of a sudden, all of this turns around. So it's just like, it's my body, my choice. Except when they tell you you gotta take something. Then all of a sudden, it's not your choice in your body anymore. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm only saying this so that you'll think for yourself. Is everything's okay, but you don't want a bus driver smoking a joint and taking your kids to school, and you don't want a man dressing up as a woman. I mean, just make a choice. You get it? Okay, it's the same thing with what you believe. If Jesus is real to you and everything he said is true, then he should be worth dying for. Okay, when you make that decision, the pastors don't even have counseling sessions anymore. They sit at their desk with no counseling sessions, no calls, because when people decide that they're going to live for God, something happens to their body, something happens to their mind, something happens to their relationships, something happens with their finances, and they don't need counseling anymore. Why? Because they took accountability. And so the undue pressure on the fivefold causes them to have to go into realms that really, literally, I don't believe that they were all called to do some of the things that they're doing. I think they're forced to do it or else we're going to leave the church and not pay your salary. And they, they manipulate you into having you do things to entertain them. And that's why when these things happened in the last couple of years, we weren't at the level, mature-wise, to take authority and to operate within the, the realm of what we should be as a church in that situation because we were ministered to in our soul, but it was called spiritual, but it was really soul. Well, you understand what's going on with the smoke machines and the lights is, is that Satan is mimicking and mocking the throne. Wow. So the church started doing that because it was Ichabod. The glory had departed, and so they have to manufacture the smoke the glory cloud, and the light show, which is in the throne room just because God's God, not because he has to have something from Amazon delivered to make a smoke machine. 
or light show. It's because God's God and it just happens. Okay, if God shows up in a church, it just happens, but you don't have to buy the smoke machine. Okay, well, what I'm saying is, is it's a mockery that it, rock concerts are a mockery of the throne room. Have you ever seen this? The Lord showed me all this when I was in heaven. He also showed me bars. He said, it says spirits above it. He said, he said that is a mockery of the communion table. I go, what? He said, Jesus would st sit there and they would all sit around him and he would serve them. It's a mockery. The bar, when they sit there and have communion, they drink, that's a mockery of the communion table. I go, whoa. He goes, and the Lord says, well, why does it say spirits over, distilled spirits over the top? Why, is this, why are they called spirits? I go, oh my God. I had never even thought of all this stuff. Now well, think about this. Everything that you see is a mockery. So why would the church want to adopt something like that when they have the real? So that's why communion is so important, and that's why when you take it unworthily, you can actually die early. That's why he says, judge yourself, lest you be judged at the table. So Judas was the first one to not judge himself, so he ate unworthily. So it says when he took that bread into his mouth, Satan entered into him. That's what Paul was trying to warn the Corinthians about. Judas ate of it and drank unworthily at the table of the Lord. He didn't discern the body. And so he, he ate and drank judgment on himself, which hurt the whole table. That's what Paul's trying to say. If you come to that table and you take communion and you're not, you're not discerning the body, it affects the whole body. And thus, some of you die early. See, you won't... You, you, you know, you don't hear this in church, but you're in a hotel. <laughs> but this is the bottom line is I'm only doing this to show you, you already know this, but I need you to transfer this to people, to Christians, wherever you go, that we have the real and we've got to count the cost for that and realize that we can expand out our ability to stay in there longer because God trusts us. So even though the last leg of the race, we're gonna to have to make up for everyone else's failure to perform their part. That's what's happening now. So you understand even though you got 60, 65 books or whatever in five years coming off of my laptop, that is only because others didn't do it. It's not because I'm that good. All that you see here, everything that's happening here is because someone else was supposed to do it. I mean, I'm a flight attendant and she's a hairdresser. And I became a captain because someone had to fly my airplane. God just made it me and said, you own it, you do this. You, buy, you have your own publishing company, you have your own TV, you have your own school, you have your own homeschooling. Do you get it? But that is because this generation is making up for others that came before us and did not build upon what Paul already did and all the, all the apostles. Do you get it? Okay, so their expansion in the first century has not been matched to this day, mathematically. But then this generation is literally the ones who will supersede the first century church. This generation will. And the reason why is, is because I approve of this message. <laughs> I, I do. Because what is on me is not normal, but it goes to you. Because you're supposed to do better than me. But see, every one of us for the last 2,000 years should have done better. But we haven't been told. So what we did is we put Smith Wigglesworth and John G. Lake and all these people on a pedestal. But all they did was exactly what God told them to do. They weren't born in a manger. They didn't have shepherds around them. What is church supposed to be? Church is supposed to be for sick people that need to get well. But once they get well, they better go and work as staff at the church. A hospital is not for well people. 
The church should be where all of us are ready with our gloves on to help people. Yeah, right. And everybody should come in and they should go through the classes and be discipled and loved upon and get rid of the devils and, and, and get them stable and then turn them around and when they're well, then they become staff. Because the hospital is not an apartment complex. The, the, the church is supposed to be, but what it has become was not effective by, by what we just went through. It was not effective. So I'm telling you, the next thing is gonna happen, besides the, the banking thing and the war that, that's coming. So they're already preparing for it. I mean, we're, we're very close to it. Okay, the next thing that's gonna happen is they have got you so reliant on the internet and your device, that, and you don't know it. Your parents know it. <laughs> I want you to make a conscious effort to get off of the reliance so that you can all, we can all communicate. And this is why I'm doing the fellowships. It's because it's gonna be set up so that when they start to restrict, because if you don't make the mark, they're gonna restrict your, your, the, what you can buy and sell. And they can also restrict your access to the internet. So what we're doing here is to get groups of people together all over the world to where you can know to report and gather at a certain time because that's what I saw in my vision when I got saved in 1980 was is that I would be going around and people knew that I would show up at a certain place in a certain city at a certain time and I would have water and food and things hidden and I would have a Bible study. Well, that's the warrior fellowships, okay? But the thing it is, is we gotta get to where if we're off grid, we're able to still communicate together. We gotta figure out how we, I'm just telling you, you, you might think I'm, half of you might think I'm crazy, but I've already said things about like Roe versus Wade. I mean, imagine it on Daystar announcing that Roe versus Wade is gonna be overturned. And after they said, after I said, I go, what did I just say? Because there's no way out of that. That's like a total miracle. Okay, but there's other things that are gonna happen as well. And one of them is, is that you've been built up with reliance on the internet and on your device. And, and what happens is, is that, is you gotta go back and think of how you did survive without a phone. And even when you had the four pound brick with that big military antenna, and you just displayed it, you're so proud of it. You know, you needed somebody else to carry it for you, but it was like this big thing. I mean, we, I actually saw a video where, where they dared kids to dial a number on a rotary phone and they couldn't do it. I'm trying to show you something here is that we have been routed a certain way, but it ends up being a controlling issue. Do you get it? Can I stop because I want to stay on? Am I still online? Wow. Intelligence agencies must be asleep or something. Huh? No, they're here. They're actually in this room. Trust me. So we got to learn how to communicate with each other in other ways. And we also have to develop our sensitivity so we can run this last way, leg. We have to be that sharp in the spirit to know that we're to meet a certain person at a certain time and that other person gets the same download and doesn't have any proof that it's actually gonna happen, but they show up and you show up. You gotta be that sharp in the days to come. You gotta know where to put your money, where not to, you got to know who to talk to and not who to talk to. No one's going to tell you this, but th this, is, this is the true prophetic. It's, it's forward-looking, but it's telling you, to, you're, you know, we're, we're walking into another trap. But there's a chess game going on that we can win at. And how you win at it is you listen to your heart, your gut feeling.
The other thing that happens is a spirit of fear will come upon you to get you to opt out of what God is telling you to do. And it, it feels real. And this is what I'm saying is that Christians think it's God telling them not to do it. It's like you're that thing and you told me to do this. And then it's, there's this feeling and it's, it's really real. And it's a demon spirit that's trying to get you to opt out of your obedience, which is going to influence a whole bunch of people. So I'm going to be very honest with you. Is when I went to NASA and I went through all that training to fly that plane, that plane is called the Widowmaker. It's killed more pilots than any other jet. It's called the Widowmaker. It was my favorite airplane until I got in it. Because they're strapping you in and you've gone through all these, all these emergency procedures. It's not just how to fly it. I went through all that. The thing that they emphasize the most is how to get out of it and live. I'm like, why is it half, half the class is on how to get out of this airplane? Well, after, after I, I pulled straight up and went to 29,000 feet straight up and I had to slow it down. And then when I went straight across the Atlantic and hit 1,100 miles an hour and they told me you gotta make your turn or you're gonna be outside the box, you're gonna get violated. I'm like pulling G's trying to stay awake going almost twice the speed of sound. The reason I'm saying all this is that when I was strapped in and they, they didn't give us our clearance, and I thought, this is NASA, we, we can do whatever we want. But there were all kinds of other things going on out there in the, in the Atlantic that we weren't supposed to see. So we're sitting there and all of a sudden, me, the guy that went to heaven started feeling claustrophobic because I'm strapped in, I can't even move. And I got an oxygen mask on because they want you breathing oxygen before you take off. And all of a sudden, it's not, it, it's not me, a spirit of fear came on me. And this is what I said to myself, what am I doing? Do I really need to do this? Can I get a refund? <laughs> Now think about that. God set this up. This is, I mean, I got five GoPros staring at me. We're filming for the kids. To get that clearance to do that is like a total miracle, they told me. And I said, Lord, what am I going to do? I can't move. I just want to get out of here. Do you ever have that feeling? Yes. I know, but see, nobody will be, you know, be honest. And I, I'm not a person of fear. I've already done things that you would never do but I don't have any fear, but something, something tried to opt me out of that. There, there's no other airplane left to fly after that one. I'm done. The only thing left is to go into orbit. There's no, I've flown every airplane that I would ever want to fly. Most pilots would just, they, they couldn't even believe that I got to fly what I flew. But what happened was, is I experienced my limit, but I didn't know I had that limit there, but a spirit of fear came in to make it feel so real to me that I knew, just do what you do when you teach your students. You know, like when I was teaching people to fly and even you, you, teaching you all, what would I say if I was wanting to console them? in this situation. And so I heard my spirit say, don't move, reach over and hit your emergency oxygen, which gives you 100% forced, which is what we do up at, the, at, at altitude to keep us awake. So I just hit that switch. We're sitting there on the taxiway, and after about two minutes, I just, my shoulders went down, and I'm like, let's do this. I, was, I, had, I had gotten myself into a frenzy I must have hyperventilated or something. But it was beyond my ability to do anything about it. I felt out of control. Because I was. I was strapped to an engine that could take me into space. This was what the astronauts use to train. And I feel like what the Lord is saying is, is I brought you this far 
and you're going to perform fine, but do not let give in ever to a spirit of fear to talk you out. Amen? And that's what the word of the Lord is. Okay? So everything that God does is pre-planned, but there... There are two, there are, there's more than, than, than this levels, but I only for this purpose of this, to deliver this to you, there are two levels to this chess game. There's more than that, but there are literally two games going on at the same time. There's the one you know about, and then there's the one you don't know about. And that one that you don't know about, you will never know about, because it's none of your business. But God is playing a game on such a high level that he knows if you're involved, you'll mess it up. <laughs> and no one wants to preach this, but this is what I saw in heaven, is God gets what he wants. He always gets what he wants. Sometimes he has to destroy the earth to get it. But if you notice, after Genesis 6, we're still alive down here. But he had to destroy the whole earth. So there's two games going on here. There's two chess games going on. There's the one that you think you're a part of and, and you're like doing it. But I want to tell you, it's, it's literally like a cardboard neighborhood. Of, of, it's literally a, a fake neighborhood, fake houses in comparison to what God is doing that you'll never know about. You see, he always gets his way. Sometimes it takes hundreds of years, thousands of years. But God has a plan that, that is beyond our understanding. So if you wanna to start to get into that game and be part of that, you're literally gonna be supernatural every day and people aren't gonna understand. See, I'm not playing in this game that you're playing in. I'm not playing in the ministry game. I'm not playing in none of this. I'm playing off grid on another board that I have no say so in. I literally just do what I'm told and I don't ask questions. And everybody's wondering, how do you do this? It's because I have opted out of being a, a part of the decision-making process. I don't have a, a, a voice to God like you think you do in this game board. This game board is completely off-grid. Nobody knows about it. I'm probably the first person's ever talked about it. But the whole thing was, is that Joshua and Caleb were on that other board. That's what's happening in this nation right now. All of us in this room are on that other board, but we know better than to even Jimmy with it. But what, I, what the Lord wanted me to tell you this morning is, is you cannot allow this to eat you up. Joshua and Caleb, it could have ate them up. But Joshua ended up taking in the whole bunch for the next generation, and that's what we're gonna do. We're going to prepare to take the whole bunch in. We're, we're preparing for that. So that's why I'm concentrating on the children. I mean, I literally hired five teenagers as full-time staff a couple weeks ago. You heard them all prophesying last night. They're barely out of high school and they're full-time staff, and they've already been told that they're taking over warrior notes. They've, they've already been told that, that they're, they're, they're gonna be the leaders. All the teenagers are being trained to take over warrior notes. See, that's why people are leaving now. No, it's like, no. <laughs> no, this is what we don't do. We don't train our kids up in the way they should go. That we should be training them to be leaders. We shouldn't be hiding them from this stuff. They're, 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 they're made aware of what's going on, the decision-making process, uh, the things that are going on with crazy people. When people act up, they, they, they know what's going on. It's not hidden from them. Why? Because they're gonna be the leaders. Joshua was not hidden from the things that were going on. He was just remaining silent, if you noticed. I mean, don't you think, I mean, think about this. Don't you think that when Moses struck the rock twice, that Joshua was like, oh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but Joshua didn't correct Moses. And that's what the Lord told me. Don't correct Moses. 
He told me that not that long ago because I started to see stuff. And I'm like, so what I did was I just took like six inches, I backed out six inches a month from people. And then when they were looking, another six inches. Before you know it, I'm outside the building. I'm outside the state. That's what you got to do. You don't make a scene. You don't, you're not supposed to be correcting Moses. Moses didn't get to go in. Joshua did. But Moses did not um, get a correction from Joshua. But you, I guarantee you, man, it says that Joshua was always there. And you know he saw that, and you know he heard the commands when he said, speak to the rock. You get it? I know this is helping me. Oh, I got 10 minutes. I better open this up. Wow, such freedom in this place. I feel drunk. All right, so would you from now on, um, because this, the topic this morning is nothing can separate us. And would, would, you, would you now from now on realize that God has another chessboard? And this happened, um, this concept, if you're interested, even if you're not, you're going to hear it anyway. But Herb Kelleher, Herb Kelleher had more influence on me with leadership than the church does. I, I learned more from him, and I was being groomed to be part of the leadership in Dallas. And I told them I'm leaving. And I was a flight attendant that was gonna go and pursue uh, you know, ministry. But this is what he, he taught me this. You're not gonna believe it. He had two offices. He had an office that everybody knew about, but then there was an inner office it was a whole nother office and it had um, a map on there. He had hired a company to extrapolate out the growth of Southwest for the next 20 to 30 years. So he expanded, we were at 29 cities. They expanded out to 212 cities and, and all the countries and they expanded out to a couple thousand aircraft from the 80, the 89 that we had. So the, what they did, the company did, was they took all the cities and the routes and they figured out the demographics and they determined which cities people would actually, uh, they would actually, uh, the only way that they would fly is if Southwest came in there. And he was after, he told me, he said, I'm not competing against other airlines, I'm competing against the car. So he, the $19, that was based on filling up an SUV at the time which will never happen again. But are you all listening to me? Yeah. This man was smart. So he said, I want to win people over to fly Southwest so they don't drive. Okay, then he said this, the key is once we get them here, we got to keep them. We want return customers. So he told us, whatever you have to do, apologize, take full responsibility for it, even though they're wrong. He said, buy them a drink. It's cost 15 cents. It costs $75 for me to have an individual call them and talk to them and give them a $50 voucher. But it costs you 15 cents for a little bottle, which I don't agree with the liquor, but um, I asked the Lord, you know, can you excuse me if I get this job, I gotta serve liquor and I don't agree with it personally. And um, he, he excused me because he said they're gonna drink it anyway. No, if someone else serves it, you know. Okay, but 15 cents for a mini is what Herb Kelleher told me. He said, so you make the decision on the profitability of this company, Kevin. You either, you either fix it with what, what, by that or you have them right in. He said they're, all, he said they're almost 90% wrong But he said, you, 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 you sit with them, you let them talk, and you resolve it there. It doesn't go any further. This is the kind of thing that he taught me, is you resolve it there. So we agreed to stay and clean the airplanes. 
so that we wouldn't have to hire a company. Well, I didn't get paid for that. So I put 13 hour days in, I got paid seven hours of flight time for 13 hours. But my profit sharing made me a millionaire when I retired. But the guy that was throwing the bags underneath, he was a millionaire too, at $12 an hour. He still sold his stock for the same price I did. So this is the thing the mentality is, is that Herb Kelleher got it. He said, my customer is you, Kevin. Your customer is the customer. He said, do whatever you can to make them come back and you'll always have a job. And you will retire with all that stock because you are this company. So he said, you take care of the customer and I'll take care of you. And that's what Jesus told me. You take care of my people and I will take care of you. And you start that flow and you extend out your ability so you're not as limited anymore. Your tolerance goes through the roof because you're fully convinced that what do we talk about? We've talked about being fully convinced. We've also talked about the fact that we get rid of our unrealistic expectations. And then we also remember that there are two chess boards really being played. And the one that counts is the one that God is playing at a high level, and it's by invitation only. But in order to participate in that one, it's, it's all this. It's none of this. In other words, you listen, and you do, and you don't talk. The chess game at that level has to do with the powers of the air. Which brings me to my closing argument. <laughs> Is, is that the reason why we have not been able to take care of some of the demonic, and that's why we're doing this warrior justice, is that the whole idea with this course, instead of like passing out buckets so you can barf in them and get rid of your demons, is and have deliverance sessions, the better way to do it is to make it so that the devil has nothing to do with you. He doesn't want anything to do with you which is warrior justice, which is why I wrote this. It's not that those things, those are the legitimately demons leaving and sometimes people throw up, but that these things come back if you haven't resolved why they were there, right? Okay, so this is the other thing is, is that to, 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 you know, we're, in order to go to Cape Town, South Africa in October, I had to be sent because I ain't going nowhere especially there or anywhere, and unless God sends me. But I've already been to Johannesburg, but I'm not sent there. If I'm not sent there, I'm not going there. Okay, why? Because you're dealing with territorial spirits there. If you're not sent, you're going to get eaten up. So the whole church is supposed to be coming against the territorial spirits not individuals. That's why people just disappear. When they start coming against certain things, they just disappear. The reason why is you can't take these things on yourself. But see, that goes over well. I know because I was there. Everything I'm telling you, I used to eye roll at people that would say this stuff. So I already know what I'm dealing with. When I say stuff, I was there. I was sitting in your shoes. Not that you're like that, but you got to understand, I, I didn't even want to go to church because I had Jesus appear to me. And I thought the whole thing was fake. Church was fake because the Jesus I met was not what they were representing to me. Jesus is like, Jesus appeared to me and he pointed his finger at me and he said, don't find yourself on the wrong side of me. And then I was told I wasn't even allowed to share that on a TV show. So I guess it's just a one-sided sword, I guess. You know, even though it's two-edged, you're only allowed to show one side of it. Because Jesus told me that the two-edged sword is one is to cut your enemy, the other side is to cut you. That goes over well. <laughs> the sword of the Spirit is supposed to cut you as well as cut your enemy. So it's unbalanced. Whoa. 
So I'm going to submit to the knife first before I go out to war. Because whatever is hanging out that's not supposed to be there, trust me, the enemy is going after that right away. And that's why people don't make it in ministry. I would rather you all just stay in, as a business person and build tents like Paul did and, and move under the power of God like Paul did or like Stephen did. I would rather you stay in the marketplace and prosper because that was the New Testament church. But like I said, culture has gotten into it and caused a, the church to be something it was never supposed to be. There's a lot of well people in there that are living in the hospital with, in an apartment that's supposed to be a healing center. The church is supposed to be for people that need help. Once you get healed, what you should do, but see, people, people just want attention. And they'll love it, negative attention. And they'll, they won't get well just so they can have attention. If you don't believe me, you should check out Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah says this. When Nehemiah went in there, he was appalled that the temple had people living in the Levites' quarters. They, were, they made it into an apartment. And it says he took, went in there and grabbed them and dragged them out. When have you heard that preached? He cleansed the temple and he put the Levites back in there. Am I right? Does anybody know about this? Huh? So it, it's happening. But I don't want any church to close. So what I need is for us to all gather together and pray and intercede for the fivefold that they fulfill their call. Amen. Amen. Okay. So how many of you, how many of you feel like, because I feel like I've clicked up about four notches just, just this weekend, you know, because I, mean, I have felt like it, but, but the biggest thing for me is, is what I just told you is about that chess game, because I have never been able to share that before, but God is operating on a higher level. Now in that higher level, in 1948, Israel became recognized, right, as a nation. But if you notice, I did the research, and I don't know if you've ever done this. Have you ever done the research on um, these things that fell out of the sky in 1947? There's, there's nine of them. And um, one of them was in Carefree, right by my house. Of course, I wasn't alive then. But these, these objects fell out of the sky. You heard about Roswell, but there were nine of them. And there were three of them in Russia, and I just, I exhausted, I, I spent three years and I did all these studies, and I had no questions about aliens and UFOs after that because I, I know that they're the, they're the demons. But the thing of it is, is the government knows that they're not from another planet, that they're from another dimension. Okay, but this is the interesting thing, that these things fell out of the sky a year before Israel became a nation. And if you look in Daniel, the angels were coming and having to fight entities that were over countries. But if you look at the order that, that they're listed, that he, he had to fight the Prince of Persia and, and the Prince of Greece, if you look, those became the world powers in succession after. They had not even been in world power at the time. See, Babylon was where they were when Daniel had that visitation. But the angels were fighting world powers that hadn't even come in. I don't know if you're catching all this. Okay, so what happened was, is that Michael was contending for Israel. And things were falling out of the sky. The, the heavens were shaken. These things were always there. Listen, I know people. I mean, I know the son of the farmer where that thing hit in Roswell. He said the cows today still won't go near that place. And he said, we were threatened to never talk. He said, he saw, he saw what he saw and it's exactly what you've read about. And this guy goes to my church at the time and he wouldn't lie to me. So what do you do with that? 
Okay, so what else that is happening now? I mean, you, you, see, the real thing is not the balloons. The F-22 wasn't made to shoot balloons down. See, what you gotta ask is, what is going on in the other chess game? Amen? Amen. You got it? Okay. So now your tolerance is going to be much better. Your sell-out point is going to be a lot longer now. And you're just going to reach down and hit your emergency oxygen, and you're going to go to the edge of space. Amen? Go. <laughs> All right. I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to go. We're going to go. We got several flights today, so I got to go to my other job. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the impartation. And um, I ask, Lord God, that there would be such a strong, strong remembrance right now from the importation and the anointing that never leaves any of, of us, any of us, that the reality that's in this room, and we come against the powers that are in the air. We come against those high territorial spirits right now because as a congregation, as the body of Christ, we can do that. And so we break the powers. And we ask you, Lord, to shake the heavens once more. Lord, shake them. Yeah, see, the devil's already calling us. <laughs> shake them, Lord. Lord, come in your glory, Lord. Manifest your power. Come, come, Lord, in your power. And show yourself. It's great and mighty. Amen. God bless you. Okay, yes. Okay. I'm not going to be disappointed, but I did a huge amount of CD series, and it, co it cost me a lot of time to do this, and um, I, don't think, I don't think that people are really understanding. I got, I got about 20 different CD sets that I did just...